All right, so it's 9 p.m. Um, I know all your time is valuable. It's your Wednesday night again. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to come to this Seven Sage webinar tonight. Um, my name is Charlie Melman, as you can see on the screen, um, at cmelman95 on Seven Sage. If you just want to chat me up, if you see me in a comment thread, or if you want, if you want to. Um, you know, message me or whatever. Um, this uh, this talk is called 154 to 173, A Tale of Logic and Games. Now, um, despite the implication of the title, I actually don't watch uh, Game of Thrones, not really a Game of Thrones guy at all. Um, but I think uh, I think it's a it's a very uh, appropriate way to title this presentation because for me, as you'll see in a second, um, the LSAT for me was very largely about uh, mastering uh, mastering the logic games, and the, I have a lot of insight to, to offer about all the other sections too. And I'm going to go over that. I'll go over an outline in a second. Um, but this, what the, the LSAT was, the, the the for me the logic games and sort of mastering the logic fundamentals. Um, yes, the, the session will be recorded and posted on Seven Sage uh, to, answer, to answer whoever's question it was that just put that in the chat, right? So let's go over a little bit about the outline of uh, what's about to happen here. So, one second. So I'm going to give you the general story of sort of what, what I did, uh, you know, what my study plan was like when I started, when I ended, all that good stuff. Uh, I'm going to tell you what I did wrong. Uh, which is extremely important because knowing what to do wrong, well, knowing what not to do rather, um, is almost as important as knowing as knowing what to do. They're two sides of the same coin. Uh, by the come to Jesus moment, uh, I mean uh, the time that I realized I was doing everything wrong, and when I realized I need to start doing things the right way. Um, I think someone's mic is on in the background, so if you can just sort of uh, mute it or whatever, that'd be great. Um, then I realized, as I said, at that come to Jesus moment, I realized what I did right. And there's only one way, there's only one way to really do this. If you want to maximize your score, by the way, I'm going to go over that. I'll briefly go over some tips for logic games, logical reasoning and reading comp. Um, because this isn't just a general study plan. This is sort of how to actually master this test. And uh, I'll, give, I'll go over some helpful resources and take your questions at the end. Um, I'll be looking at the chat throughout the presentation as well. So if you guys have any urgent, you know, very topical questions that you want to ask, feel free, absolutely. Um, and I will, I'll answer them as soon as I can. So again, I think someone's, let me see if I can uh, actually disable the, uh, the mics from everyone else. All right, so I can mute myself here. Let me see if I can. So if you have, so if you're if you're attending the talk and uh, your mic is on, just turn it off. Just turn off your uh, sound. I think you can disable that in the, in the little chat window or like right next to the chat window. Just make sure you're muted. All right, so let's get into it. Right. So the general story. So I started studying for the LSAT. I started studying for the LSAT in September 2015. Right. I started off with a 154. Uh, as you can tell by the title, right? Very, very imbalanced. And, you, and I know you're going to look at this. A lot of people are going to look at this and you're going to say, oh my God, why am I even here? All he had to do was learn logic games, most learnable section of the test. Like he was already good at logical reasoning. Minus four is incredible. Like minus eight on reading comp is extremely very good. Like why am I even here, right? Well, it's sort of representative and not representative, right? On, uh, on logic games, um, Obviously, I did poorly. I just had absolutely like zero idea how to do the games. I, I mean, my, I said like minus twenty ish. It might have been like minus twenty two. Like I, I, I really just had no idea what the hell I was doing on logic games. On reading comp, you know, I, you know, I, um, as you, as you see there, I'm a philosophy and history major, so I have a pretty good background with reading and writing. Even still, I mean, I still, I still missed eight questions. Um, Tough section. I mean, it's a really, really hard section. I'm going to go over some tips for uh, for how to really maximize your performance on reading comp. It's much more learnable than people think it is. Okay, um, and that score fluctuated a lot over time, as did my logical reasoning score. It's, it's minus four, and I, I know you're going to think, "Oh my god, incredible score!" Right? I went through periods where I was getting ten wrong on logical reasoning. I went through periods where I 
got, you know, on, on the actual test, I got one wrong on logical reasoning. So I fluctuated a lot. Um, the, the minus four was just kind of a lucky score. I'll go over some, uh, some things I learned about LR as well. Um, I took the test in June, as I said, uh, last month. I originally planned to take it in February. That's a whole story in itself. That'll sort of be in the come to Jesus moment section. Um, and um, as I said, college student majoring in philosophy, history, and, uh, and economics. By the way, as I, I saw uh, Dylan put in the, the chat, I think someone just did it, but I'll just mention it again. If you are um, if you're listening in uh, on the presentation, please, please mute your, your mic. It's distracting for me and other people as well. So I'm going to tell you how not to study, right? Um, Initially, I went into – so what I did is I took my diagnostic, got the 154, okay? My original goal um, was to get a 174. Uh, I, just, I wanted a tw clean 20-point increase. I like round numbers, right? Eventually, my round, my love of round numbers um, and love of perfection drew me to wanting to get a 180. Uh, and, of course, I didn't get there. But I think um, that sort of drive is what led me to realize that I was studying the wrong way and to go about studying the right way. And regardless of whether or not you want a 165 or you want a 180 or you want to really break the test and get a 186 or something, um, there's really one right way to study and the, what, what I'm about to tell you is the wrong way to study, just unequivocally, no matter what score you want to get, right? So I got the, I got the diagnostic. And while I was reading the like the Power Score Bibles, like the Power Score Logic Games Bible, the Power Score Logical Reasoning Bible, I wasn't like familiar with Seven Sage at this point yet. While I was doing that, um, I took practice tests, some some sections I think, but uh, I was really sort of taking like full practice tests right from the get go, because I thought that I could just sort of absorb the material organically, right? I thought that you know by taking the tests. I could, you know, build my stamina up while also, you know, figuring out like the mechanics of the test and how it worked and just sort of like, like just feeling out the test makers. It was, it was a very imprecise thing. There was no sort of like breaking stuff down and analyzing it. It was just sort of like, hmm, yeah, I'm going to, I'm just going to see what the test makers are thinking here. Um, you know, on this logical reasoning question, I'm going to get it, I'll get it wrong, but then I'll go and look at the explanation and say, ah, okay. They kind of want this ish, I think, right? So I'll try to be better at that in the future. I mean, you, you're probably listening to me saying this, and you're thinking like, "What the hell is he talking about?" That doesn't intuitively make any sense to me. Yeah, right. It, it, you're completely right. It doesn't. Um, and the reason I did that is, frankly, just because I, you know, I, I'll be honest. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a relatively good student, and that's just sort of how I usually do things. Um, and frankly, I didn't want to put in the um, incredible amount of work it takes to really maximize your score on the LSAT. Eventually I had the come to Jesus moment, of course, but we'll get to that. But I just want to let you know that kind of like osmosis, just sort of diving right into it and hoping that good stuff will follow. It really doesn't work. Um, I didn't blind review anything. Um, again, caller, please mute your mic. Uh, I didn't bl uh, blind review anything. A, a fatal, just ridiculous error. Um, I, that's not to disparage anyone here who's not doing blind review at the moment. I'm just like, it's, you know, I'm not being overly negative. I'm just saying you should, um, you know, the, the blind review process, as we'll talk about is really how you internalize the material. It's how you identify your mistakes. It's how you identify your potential, um, and your true knowledge of the material. And it's how you can really sort of, can really sort of break down the mechanics of the test learn what the logic is behind the questions, what actually is going on here instead of this sort of, hmm, feels like answer choice B. No, no, no. Like it's, it's really sort of analyzing, you know, why do I think it's B? Why is A wrong? You know, what's the logical structure here? All that is, is really necessary to, to improving your performance on the test in a sustainable way. And uh, I also took, and we'll get to this uh, in a little more detail in a little bit. Um, the, I took practice tests at a really stupid pace. I mean, um, you know, it, it, it was, it, it took me a long time to realize. Um, and, uh, seven sages own Nicole Hopkins actually gave me a, a really good, uh, primer on this. It took me a, a long time to realize that, um, practice tests have diminishing marginal returns, meaning that, um, the, you know, it, more tests doesn't necessarily equal more skill. 
right? Like the increase in score per test um, diminishes like with as you take more and more and more tests. And once you get to a certain frequency of practice tests, I mean, if you've, if you've studied for the LSAT at all, you know that it's just unbelievably grueling, right? Just mentally so grueling. Um, so, you know, if you take too many tests in a, in a row in too short a span of time, it's like you, you know, run 10 miles five days in a row. I don't know about you. I can't do that, right? My muscles just get tired. You're, similarly, your brain just gets tired. Um, your brain, as we'll, as I'll talk about in a little bit, your brain is really like a muscle uh, when it comes to training for something as rigorous as the LSAT. You need to work it out for sure. You need to exercise the brain, but you need to let it rest, right? You need to you need to chill. You need to let it rest a bit. You need to do things that aren't the LSAT. Uh, some you know non mentally draining things. You know, play some FIFA, watch some YouTube videos, hang out with friends. Friends are important. Um, but you can't go and take practice tests um, at a clip of, you know, more than I'd say at max three a week, really two a week. You really don't because you, you want to build in enough time for blind review and build in at least one day per week of complete abstention from the LSAT. So really not more than two a week. I did, a, I did three a week for a little bit and it was okay for you know, a, little, a little while, um, but would not recommend um, taking more practice tests for the sake of taking them. Uh, it's not going to help you. And in fact, it, it could actually affirmatively hurt you um, because of the, the stress you're putting on your brain. So here's the, here's the come to Jesus moment, right? So I had been um, studying since uh, early September, 2015, right? As I said, I was originally slated to take the test in February of 2016. Um, there are a few reasons for that, uh, even though I'm so I'm going into my senior year of college right now. Um, you might ask, well, why are you planning to take it in February? I just want to get it done, get it over with, move on with my life, right? Um, no one wants to, uh, well, I'll, I, won't, I won't say no one wants to, but it's very hard for people to, you know, mentally commit themselves to a, you know, eight, nine month LSAT journey from the very beginning. It just feels uh, really, really difficult, right? Um, you know, I, personally, even for me now, like when I have to start, you know, some massive project, I just think, oh my god, like, you know, I have so much work ahead of me. I have to plan this. It's going to take forever. There's no end in sight. Yada yada yada. It's really tough to commit yourself to that, right? Um, and so I was just anxious for the LSAT to be over, uh, quite frankly. So it got to about, um, I want to say, about November. Right. I was taking practice tests. I was doing pretty well. I was sort of like straddling the um, one upper 160s, like low 170s barrier. Right. But I, I wasn't really um, I wasn't really internalizing the material. I was kind of shooting from the hip a little bit. And I really wasn't getting the logic games yet. Um, it was it was really, really tough for me to get enough repetitions in while I was taking all these practice tests and taking my classes and all the you know, I had all these things going on in my life. It was really, really difficult for me to actually, you know, sit down with you know a bunch of logic games and do the blind review method um, that's on. You know, you can you can find it easily uh, accessible on Seven Sage. You know, you can do the blind review method, uh, go back over a period of literally weeks, redo logic games you did. You know, truly learn the material. And I'll go over my specific logic games tips in a little bit. You can you can kind of see them, you know, down here. Uh, a little preview, but I wasn't taking the necessary time to learn how to do things the right way. Right. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So around, so I kept, I still kept at it though. Right. I, I kept plugging away from, you know, around Thanksgiving when I realized I might be running into some trouble through, uh, about new year's. Now after, so I go, I don't know about you guys, I go on my winter break uh, from, from college in, um, around Christmas. And so after Christmas, I was like, okay, uh, no problem. I've only taken uh, like, I don't know, uh, 10, 15, 10 tests or something like that, right? 10 practice tests. And uh, I'll, I know what I'll do. I'll take... You know, I have I have like uh, 35 days until until the February test. Oh, th uh, I appreciate the link, Tyler. Thank you. Um, I so I have like 35 days till the February test, 
And I've read that, um, you know, you're supposed to take like, you know, 40 practice tests more or less, right. To, you know, to maximize your score. I just kind of read that and I was like, Oh, it's, you know, more repetitions equals better score. And, uh, I have to hit this number. Um, and how am I going to budget my time? So I hit this number, right. You know, I just have to get to 40 tests and that's, you know, that's, what's going to do it for me. Um, so that in itself isn't the error, you know, the, the fatal error here. What really went wrong um, in, my, in my mind, in my thought process, was thinking, hmm, so I have 35 days until the test. I should take about 30 more tests. That's fine. I can just take, you know, test at about a clip of one a day. I'm on my winter break anyway. I'll just keep taking practice tests. You know, in, in hindsight, that just sound, you know, having, you know, done the LSAT for months and months and months, um, you know, that just is crazy. Uh, it, it's just, it's completely impracticable in the, in the real world. Um, in, in that, you know, you, you almost physically can't sustain that level of activity. It, it, it would be akin to running a marathon every day for a month. You know, it's ridiculous. Um, just can't be done. Uh, and, and in, in addition to that, in, in addition to like the, like the physical impossibility of the task, uh, it, it doesn't actually do anything for you. And, and as I said before, you know, piling that much work on yourself will do, will hurt you in two ways. Number one, it'll, you know, it'll just completely wear your brain out, as I said. And number two, you don't have enough time to blind review your work. You don't have enough time to, to let the, to, 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 to take some time after your practice tests, chill out, you know, stress, eat some ice cream or something play a little soccer, you know, chill out for a few hours, have some lunch, whatever, go back to the test, approach it with a clear mind, like do the, do the blind review, which, uh, is if you, if you don't know what blind review is, uh, blind review is, um, so you, you take a test, right? You circle everything that you were not a hundred percent sure about every question that you don't absolutely know the answer to you circle it. While you're doing the test, you finish the test, take a little time, as I said, you know, stress, eat some ice cream, play soccer, have lunch, whatever. You go back to the test. Now, when you're going back to the test, you, with absolutely no time constraints whatsoever, none, you go back to every question that you circled, every question that you circled, and you break down the question stem. And each the the question stimulus, the question stem, and each answer choice, and you systematically identify like the logical structures of each one, why and like what's wrong with it, why each uh, wrong answer choice is wrong, and why each right answer choice is right. And you do this for every single question that you circled. Okay, you do that. You go and you go then and only then. Do you go and actually score the test, right? After you, after you do your first run, before you've done the review of the circled questions, you do not score the test. You don't look at the answers. You don't go, you don't do anything related to the test. After you do that review of your circled questions, you go and score the test, right? Um, you then after that, um, this isn't sort of in the seven stage uh, blind review orthodoxy, but this is sort of what I did. And I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit in the next section. After that, you go and read or watch the videos for the explanations for every question that you circled and or got wrong, right? And you do that until you completely understand everything. Um, that's, that's the blind review method, okay? And when you're hearing me say that, your completely, completely reasonable response will probably be, geez, Charlie, that takes a ton of time. Oh my God. Like how, how, how long did it take you to do that? Right. Completely fair question. And the answer is a lot of time. Um, I didn't actually time like how long the average blind review process took, but just the process of the, of the blind review probably took, you know, depending on how I did on the tests, um, you know, probably took a couple hours at least probably three hours, you know, per, per test just for the blind review stuff. So it, I'll tell you though, there is absolutely no better investment a time investment you can make in your in your LSAT studies than blind review. There is simply no better method, absolutely none, bar none, one hundred percent. The time that you spend uh, blind reviewing and then going over the explanations, 
um, is completely invaluable, right? And I'm sort of getting ahead of myself a little bit here because a lot of this will sort of be covered in the what I did right section. Um, but I just want to let you know that's what blind review is and that's why I'm stressing it so much. So getting back to the point at hand for a moment. So, you know, what happened was I started doing this whole, you know, test a day thing, right? And uh, I quickly realized, you know, something was wrong. You know, my scores were really, really dipping. Um, I was terribly stressed. I was irritable. Um, you know, I was like, you know, I was lashing out at, I, you know, I wasn't a mean person or anything, but I was sort of on a, on a you know, my fuse was sort of short with people I, I knew and loved. You know, it was really taking a toll on me. And this was only after doing this for like a week because I was super burned out and I knew my test was coming up, right? So I took a few days uh, off, not of the LSAT, but to just completely pound logic games. Just studied it and studied it and studied it for like three days straight, like barely came out of my room. And then I went to take tests again, right? Because I, as I said, logic games were my Achilles heel. I figured all I have to do is master the logic games, come back to the LSAT, keep taking tests, right? Came back to the LSAT, kept taking tests. And I still sucked, right? The reason why is because I wasn't giving myself, I wasn't giving my brain enough time to rest and and uh, absorb the material, right? You might have heard other people on the forums say this, on the Seven Sage forums. You might have seen some webinars in which people have said what I just said. Um, you might have seen JY say it himself in some contexts. Um, even though I, I might be repeating the orthodoxy a little bit, I, I, I think it's it's it, it, the importance of... of uh, giving yourself, giving your mind enough time to really absorb the material cannot be overstated. Um, it's, it's, um, the, the mental health component to this, uh, as well as, you know, simply just giving yourself enough time to, you know, do the blind review process and master all the sections, you know, that cannot be overstated without that. I mean, I'll, I'll put it in, in LSAT speak that that's a necessary condition, um, for, you know, maximizing your potential on this test. And I sincerely believe, you know, I've talked to a lot of people, um, you know, who've taken the LSAT or who are in the process, both on Seven Sage and um, on TopLawSchools.com, which you know I know uh, a lot of Seven Sagers kind of like to make fun of, but you know I, I am on Top Law Schools, so it's a, it's a good forum. Um, I've talked to a lot of people on those forums, and I'm thoroughly convinced that people miss out on many, many LSAT points, and therefore like many, many thousands of dollars. Uh, just by not giving themselves enough time to do things the right way, right? So I realized that this was the come to Jesus moment. I realized, okay, I might not want to do all this excruciatingly hard work on the LSAT, right? I might not want to postpone my test date to June, but I... And, you know, maybe I'll get lucky in February, right? Maybe the logic game section will be easy, right? Maybe my logical reasoning score will get more consistent the next month. Maybe, 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 right? Truth is it wasn't. But even if even if it, I was just running a risk, it's not worth it. The LSAT is worth far too much to take it when you're not completely ready. You have to know in your bones that you are ready to kill this test, before you go in and take it. And so, you know, I, I realized on, I think January 1st of this year, so a nice little inflection point, natural inflection point, that I would be doing myself a disservice that amounted to potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars of scholarship money, depending on, you know, which schools I wanted to apply to, if I took the test too early. And that, that applies to all of you as well. If you take the test before you, before you're really ready, it's not, it's, you know, you're wasting a take and you're stressing yourself out. Don't do it, right? So I realized I had to postpone. I realized that if I really wanted to do this, if I really wanted to go to law school, um, I had to I had to go back to the basics. I had to master my logical foundations. I had to do things the right way. Now, the right way to do things is basically as follows, right? So the first bullet point is something that um, I actually sort of didn't, do because as I said, I, you know, I, I never did it right. Because I, I, I sort of had taken like a lots of practice tests to the, and read all like the power score Bibles to the point where, um, I, I, like, going back and sort of mastering individual sections wouldn't, you know, wouldn't have been 
super helpful. But if I'm if I could go back to my September 2015 self and tell him to you know tell him to do something differently, tell him what to do differently, I would tell him to I would tell that naive person to focus on on mastering the logical foundations first and then focus on defeating each section one at a time. What I mean by that is, you know, let's say you take your diagnostic and, uh, you know, your weak spot is reading comp, right? Very common. Um, you, you, the first thing you do is, you know, you, you study whether it's, whether you're enrolled in the seven stage curriculum, which as you can tell from the last bullet point, I highly, highly, highly recommend, even if you just get the most basic, I, I have the ultimate package, right? Even if you just get like the, the basic starter package, in my opinion, and this is, I, I swear to God, seven stage has not paid me to say this, um, bet probably the best value there is in, uh, in LSAT prep for the, the $179, uh, starter course. Again, completely. Yeah, you know, so I've not. I haven't been paid to say that. Really fantastic value. Um, whether whether you, you're using that or you know Power Score, the LSAT uh, trainer, or anything like that, you know, use those resources to master the logical foundations first. You know, what's a contrapositive? Uh, what's a mistaken reversal? Uh, you know, what's the transitive property? Yada yada yada. All that kind of stuff, right? Master the the logic basics, and then once you've done those basic drills. Tackle each section one at a time. Reading comp, logical reasoning, logic games, all beasts. All just really, really hard, hard things to do. If you try to do it all at once, you're going to get completely overwhelmed. And that's kind of what happened to me at first, right? And again, I'm not trying to toot my own horn here. I'm just, you know, mentioning for purposes of the talk. You know, I have a pretty good academic record, um, but even still... Um, and I, I, I go to a relatively, you know, good state school, even still, um, incredibly hard for me to do, doing it together. Don't do it. Don't do all the sections together, master each one. And then once you are confident that you really sort of have a, a good, you know, solid, if not masterful grip on, uh, on each section, you know, as I said, it does not have to be masterful, just good. Then you move on to the next one right? In decreasing order of priority, right? So, you know, reading comp is your biggest issue. Focus on reading comp first. Give yourself the most time to, to master reading comp or, you know, you know, do well enough, as well on reading comp as you want to do. Then move on to logic games, then logical reason, right? Once you've done all that and after all three of those section types are done, uh, then and only then um, can you move on to take full length practice tests. Um, I think a general timeline for all of this could be, you know, it, it, again, it varies completely by person. You might have natural strengths in some areas, natural weaknesses in others. General timeline um, would say I would say maybe three months to you know for the sections, about roughly a month for each section, three months for the sections and the accompanying drills, and then six months to take practice tests at a pace of, you know, one a week, increasing to two a week, a little later on in your prep. That should get you about 25, maybe up to 30, excuse me, uh, 25, maybe up to 30 practice tests. And I think for a lot of people, uh, that will be a, you know, a rel an optimal number of tests to do. Um, I see a question, you know, uh, what's the transitive property? So the transitive property is if A then B, if B then C, if A then C, right? That's the transitive property. So, for example, um, you know, uh, all um, you know, all major league baseball players are men, right? All men um, are humans. Therefore, all major league baseball players are human, right? So that that's the transitive property. Um, and thanks, Tyler, for the explanation uh, in the chat. Um, when you're taking practice tests, when you've actually moved on to the practice test phase, uh, you really want to make sure that you are absorbing and internalizing the material. In short, you want to make sure that you're, that you're learning, right? When I, when I studied for the LSAT, I learned a lot about learning and how people actually learn for things. Um, you don't do it by, you know, as I said before, you don't do it by sort of just like, you know, doing stuff and then hoping it absorbs, right? You actually have to understand with a test as lo as logical as the LSAT, 
you have to understand like what is going on behind the scenes, like what, how the sausage is made, so to speak. Right. And you want to understand for every single question, even the ones you didn't circle on blind review, even the ones you got right with some ease, just to be sure, just to be sure it'll only help you. You want to be sure why, like what the logical structure of the question is, what the flaw is, if there is one, you know, what the structure of the, the reading comp passage is, sort of like what's going on, right? All that kind of stuff. Um, you know, what, how, to, how to diagram the logic game, like what's the appropriate, you know, method to, of, of doing it, right? Um, you want to understand all that. And then you want to understand why, what the question is asking. And you want to understand why the right answer was right and the wrong one is wrong. Now, this is especially important for those of you who are gunning for a 170 plus. And for me, you know, as someone who is gunning for a 180, I was gunning for a 180, frankly, because I think everyone should gun for a 180. You know, you shoot, what is it, shoot for the stars, something, something, you might land among, you know, shoot for the moon, you might land among the stars, something like that. Um, kind of a dumb, uh, a, dumb expo a dumb phrase, in my opinion, because the stars are further away from the moon. But anyway, um, Basically, you want if you, you you try for the best, you do your best, and if you don't achieve that perfect score, which you know we, we, we probably won't, um, you have done the best you can, right? So I encourage everyone to to if you have the time to adopt this methodology. You know, go over after you've done the blind review, after you've gone back, you've scored the test, right? Um, after you've done all that. You go back, and this is what I this is what I would do after every practice test. I would take the test, blind review it using the method I outlined before, right? Score the test, look at all the explanations for the questions I got wrong and or the questions I circled, right? And then uh, I would take the test at a clip of about a one a week, right? And what I would do in the intervening days is I would uh, get a clean copy uh, of the tests, right? Um, and I would do this by you. You could uh, they, they they don't sell PDFs anymore, so you could like photocopy the test before you take it or something like that. Um, so I would get a clean copy of the test. If you don't have a clean copy, that's fine. I would I would do that, and then I would go over every single question untimed, completely untimed, every question of every section. And I would just sort of, you know, I would, I would, I would go to a quiet place and I would look for the logical structure of the question and I would sort of check off in my mind, hmm, right, this is, right, this is what's going on here. This is the, this is the logic here. I get this. And then, you know, answer choice A makes this flaw, B makes this flaw, C is right because of X and yada, 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 right? Um, so, you know, that's what I would do. For every single question, I would pick it apart. The, I would pick apart the logical structure. I'd pick apart what the LSAT writers are trying to do. I would make a mental note of if I've seen it before, all that kind of stuff, right? And if I didn't understand something, I would look at explanations. And I'll go over helpful resources in a second. So I'll tell you like, where I found my explanation, where, where, where I found good explanations online, you know, how to make use of, you know, explanation, uh, how to find good explanations, whether or not you're using seven sage. Um, but, uh, you know, it's very crucial to, to get explained anything you don't really understand. Otherwise you're just going to go on being wrong. Right. And then, we'll, you know, what's the point of studying? Another thing I did right, as I said, was to postpone the test. Very difficult decision to commit myself to four more months of studying for the LSAT, you know, February to June. Yeah. Four, four more months to check myself there. Um, really tough thing to do mentally. But as I said, you know, the, the process takes time. You might have a very, you know, a very smart friend who studied for three months. The diagnostic was a 165. They ended up getting a 177. I can't do that. Most people can't do that. I think the people who can do that are, you know, geniuses. Um, you know, some people can do that, but most people can't. So you, you, you have to realize if you're in this, you, you, there's so much at stake here that you have to be really in this to do, uh, your, your absolute best. Um, there's too much scholarship money at stake. There's too many, you know, law school opportunity, uh, and admission opportunities at stake. There's just, there's too much at stake here to, to do anything but your very best on this test. 
And in the grand scheme of things, you know, what's, you know, even if you take, as I did, like nine months to study for it, okay, you know, so it's, 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 it's the length of a pregnancy. You know, you, you carry the baby to term. But you have the whole rest of your life to live, you know, and you can, you can look back on this experience as a, you know, uh, a relative blip, you know, in the, in the grand uh, time scale of your life. It's completely worth it. And frankly, it's the best investment you could ever make in yourself uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, you know, the, the scholarship and admission stuff I already said. Uh, two, um, there's a, there, there was a study done by, I think UC Berkeley, or at least it was published, uh, like some report on it was published by Berkeley that said, um, that said that, you know, people who study intensely for the LSAT over a, of a, of a, over a prolonged period of time actually like can permanently alter the, like the structure of their brains. They can sort of permanently rewire some of their neural connections, um, such that they are, uh, smarter, just objectively smarter on intelligence tests, you know, as I said, permanently, um, you know, it, it, studying intensely for the LSAT actually sort of rewires your brain to think more logically, more clearly, and, uh, more precisely and accurately. Um, so absolutely worth it in, uh, in that respect. And also if you get a high enough score, you can make a crap ton of money tutoring. I'm not a tutor, but, uh, it's possible. That's like a, you know, it's, a, it's not, it, it, it's, it's not even a tertiary concern. Um, the, the, the concern is maximizing your admissions and scholarship opportunities. And if you get, say, you know, just to pick a number, a round number, you know, $100,000 in scholarship money, huge scholarship, right? But let's just assume that's basically $100,000 in tax-free income. So you're never going to get that opportunity again. Um, and then, you know, what else did I do right? Enrolling in Seven Sage, frankly. The forum here, as you know, this community is just absolutely fantastic and helpful and supportive. Um, I used uh, JY's logic games explanations and curriculums extensively. Uh, I thought that his method was ob just objectively superior. And again, I'm not being paid to say this. I just volunteered to do this talk. Thanks, Tyler, for the link to the Berkeley study, by the way. Um, it's just objectively a better method of doing logic games than power score. And I think power score is sort of revising their method now to be a little more like the seven stage method. Um, so for that, for uh, logical reasoning, I thought power score was quite good. I also thought that seven stage was um, quite good um, for reading comp. Uh, again, you know, it's, I, I, I thought that uh, seven stage was strong there as well. And the explanations, the, the video explanations for the prep tests, absolutely like, top, top notch and uh, invaluable to my prep. So uh, I'll give you some, some quick tips on, I, I apologize. I've taken a little bit longer than I wanted to so far, but I'll sort of give you some quick tips on, uh, the games, logical reasoning, uh, and reading comp, and uh, I'll take I'll take some questions then too. So, for for the games, right? I I, I heard a, you know an elder of mine say you know the way to get good at anything practice repetition rehearsal, right? The only way to do this is the foolproof method. Uh, since Tyler's linking to everything, I assume he can find the uh, the the link to the foolproof method um, from from Seven Sage. Uh, the foolproof method is basically uh, doing a logic game. If you don't do it within the target time and or you get even one question on that game wrong, you watch the video explanation on 7 Sage, the free video explanation, I should add. Uh, then you go back and do it again until you get it right, right? And then my little addendum to this is, oh, by the way, right and under time. My little addendum to this is to take, write down the game, you know, prep, Prep test uh, 64, game three, right? Write it down on a post-it note, you know, keep it somewhere. Then go back to that game in, in another day or an another two days. Do it, do it again, right? If you can do it again under time and all that, great, great. Um, if not, do it again and again and again until you get it. And if you can't do it, I mean, sorry, if you can do it, then you do it again in another week. Just keep testing yourself. See if the material sticks. And if it doesn't, keep doing it over and over and over again and watching the explanations over and over and over again, right? You, it, it, it's, it's, it's too repetitive for you not to assimilate some of this information. Again, Tyler, Tyler with the links. Thank you. Um, now, you know, something that frankly, you know, 
I've seen this this orthodoxy a lot. Um, it's on the you know it's on the foolproof method uh, guide. I've said a lot of very praise you know praiseful things about seven stage this far. I, I do think this is maybe a little bit of an exaggeration that it's the that the foolproof method is a foolproof method to a minus zero. Um, frankly, I don't I don't personally think there's a foolproof method to a minus zero. I think this is the closest thing there is to it. But I think that sort of, you know, I got into this mindset where I was maniacally chasing the minus zero. Um, I just thought that if I couldn't do it, something had to be wrong with me because there's a foolproof method to do it. You know, everyone's doing it. All the cool kids are doing it. Um, it I have to be able to get a minus zero. And if I'm not, then I'm just dumb. I, I have to say, you know, games are very repetitive, but they're also extremely hard in my opinion. I mean, they were my weakest section. I just think they're very, very hard. Um, and so I think the best thing to do is to shoot from minus zero, know that it's definitely attainable. Um, it's the most improvable, uh, learnable section of the test, but, uh, you know, don't feel terrible about yourself. If you only end up getting like minus three or something, it's still fantastic. And just know that there are, you know, there's always opportunities to improve on, on logic games. It's the most straightforward section of the test. You want to focus on accuracy when you're learning, not speed. Uh, you'll, this, this goes for all the other sections too, by the way. You, speed comes when you just intuitively understand the material. And you only intuitively understand the material when you put in the effort, the learning effort required to be accurate. Right? So you, you have to, in your effort to be accurate and get everything right, you have to, you have to do all the work that I talked about before to understand the mechanics of the test. Once you do that, you'll get accurate. At first, you'll get accurate and you'll be slow, but you'll start seeing stuff more and more and more and more. You'll start seeing things over and over again. Things will start to repeat. You'll start to recognize patterns on games and on all the other sections. And once you start subconsciously recognizing those patterns, the speed just organically comes. Um, you should use the, the logic games method that works for you, right? So I think this is kind of a personal thing. Uh, people learn logic games in sort of different ways. There are different diagramming methods. Originally, I um, I used PowerScore. I just got the logic games Bible, read it twice. You know, that, that was it. That was what I did. Um, and then I sort of came upon a Seven Sage free video explanation on YouTube. And it was like a like a, rev, uh, a revelatory thing. I was like, oh, my God, this this makes so much more sense. Incredible. Like I, the, the power score method didn't seem to make sense to me just intuitively, but the seven stage method made a lot more sense to me. Um, it just seemed like it, it, it was intuitive. Um, so, you know, you find the method that works for you. You know, if you look at the seven stage videos and you're like, eh, I don't really see why he's doing this. And then you read, you know, like the LSAT trainer, the power score book. And you're like, ah, now it all makes sense. Right. Perfect. You got it run with it. There's no objectively method, uh, right method for doing logic games. Um, I happen to think seven sage is objectively, you know, superior to a lot of others. Just, that's just me, but you know, shop around a little bit, uh, to the extent you financially can and find the method that works for you. There's no one right way. For logical reasoning, um, I recommend, uh, drilling every every different question type. Um, you know, seven stage categorizes the logical reasoning questions by type, uh, power score does. I haven't used any other materials, but I'm sure they do like, you know, the LSAT trainer in Manhattan or whatever. Um, you want to drill like each type first. Uh, well, first you want to master your logic fundamentals. I have that as the last bullet here, but it really should be the first before you do anything else, like master the logic fundamentals. Um, after you do that, right, you want to master every uh, master every question type, drill every question type. You know your necessary assumptions, your sufficient assumptions, parallel reasoning, parallel flaw, this and that, the other. Um, by doing that and sort of identifying where your weak spots are, you sort of piece by piece get to the point where you know you can do entire logical reasoning sections. You know, bump from question to question, and uh, you know get to do things under time. Uh, so master each question type. Um, for every hard question, even if you got it right, um, you know, if you if you thought it was hard, it's worth watching the explanation for because if you thought it was hard, you run the risk of um, getting it wrong on on test day, right? So explanations, going over things. I'll say it again: explanations, explanations, explanations. Right? You need to have someone who is very well acquainted with this test tell you for sure. 
you know, what is really going on here. So you understand what's going on behind the scenes. Similar to that, as I said before, you want to dissect the logical structures. I won't, I won't dwell on that any further. Um, the 20 and 20 rule, there's a little bit of debate about this. Uh, I think some people, I think Pacifico on the forums, you know, said he likes to push himself to do 25 and 25. Um, you know, personally, I, you know, I agree with the idea that you should push yourself to, you know, hit these benchmarks where it's like, Five and five, 10 and 10, 15 and 15, 20 and 20. By the way, that means 20 questions in 20 minutes. Sorry, I should have clarified that. Um, you want to hit those benchmarks, right? Personally, I didn't find that it would have been particularly helpful to rush to do all 25 questions in 25 minutes because the hardest questions take a long time to do relatively. Um, but I found that when I, once I started to push myself to do 15 questions in 15, it got easier to do 20 questions in 20. And once I did 20 questions in 20, I had enough time for the hardest questions to spend much more time on them, really think about each question and the answer choice, and have a much better shot of getting it right. And on the actual test, I don't know what the exact number was, but I think I, I ended up like going back and changing, like after I finished the section, I went back and changed my answers to like, you know, three, four logical reasoning questions. And if I didn't do any of that, I probably, my score would have been like several points lower. So that was critically important to me. And, you know, in point of fact, you know, that leaving that extra time, learning to leave that extra time um, um, could actually have earned me, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in scholarship money. Again, I mean, it's just incredibly, incredibly important. Um, Tyler asks, when going through 2020, uh, were you answering them all or using the skipping strategy? Skipping strategy. Um, you know, usually um, – I would, you know, be able to answer them all. Um, usually, uh, that that's just me. Um, but I, for sure, I was not above skipping questions. Um, if it was a hard question, if I read, if I read the stimulus and then the stem and then the answer choices, and it didn't seem to make sense, I would quickly sort of like go back, and glance over this, those, you know, three elements, see if I missed anything, and uh, if I. Um, if I still couldn't figure out what was going on, if I was still kind of a little befuddled, I would circle it, say, screw this, move on. Um, absolutely. If you guys don't know what the skipping strategy is, if you the skipping strategy is basically to skip when you do what I just did. Um, it's I can't stress to you how, how bad it is, a habit, how bad the habit is to um, – uh, to sort of dwell on like question seven when it gives you a ton of trouble. Avoid time sinks, as Tyler says. Yes, um, it's a terrible investment of your time. Um, and I already went over mastering uh, logic fundamentals, so I won't dwell on that um, anymore. But uh, I can't, again, I can't stress enough, uh, pushing yourself to be faster once you've mastered the, fun the fundamentals is good. Um, but, you know, make sure you have enough time for those hard, those hard questions at the end. It will save you. Uh, now, reading comp tips. Now, I know a lot of people are um, probably going to pay attention to this in, in particular because I know reading comp is a real bear for a lot of people. And um, reading comp, in my opinion, and in Seven Sage's opinion too, actually, because if you look at the uh, if you look at the, um, the the difficulty ratings of like uh, RC passages on the newer tests, like in the analytics page, uh, Seven Sage actually agrees with me that uh, the new reading comp just can, tends to be consistently really tough. Um, and actually on, on test day, not that any of you really care, but, um, you know, reading comp was always my strongest section. Um, like there was, you know, I, it was just, I, I just got it. Um, I, I still have tips to give you and I still have good advice to give you. So don't, you know, don't discount what I'm about to say, but you know, reading comp is my strongest section, right? Um, went into the test, got a minus one on logic games. So that was nice. Got like a minus um, like two, I think, on uh, logical reasoning. So that was nice. Um, and I got a minus four on reading comp, which is good, but like well below my average. And it's just kind of funny to me that like reading comp was the thing that, that tripped me up the most on uh, on test day. The reason why is because reading comp is just really, really hard on these new tests. Um, so here, so instead of me just complaining, uh, here's my advice, okay? The number one thing that I see people do over and over and over again on reading comprehension that is just, I, I don't want to say it's inexcusable because that sounds too harsh. I, I, it, it, it's, it's extremely improvable, right? It's a, you, you don't do this and it's easy not to do this, right? The thing that 
people do so often is they get bored. They get bored. They see this passage on, uh, like on my test, it was about like, you know, like Near Eastern sand art or something like that. It was like something ex extraordinarily boring and dry that I just couldn't give a crap about, right? They see something like that, you know, they have to read five paragraphs of this, it gets absurdly technical, and people just zone out. Once you do that, you've already lost. Reading comp is so dense um, and so packed with detail, the passages are, that if you lose, if you lose your focus for a second, and by the way, I found myself losing focus a lot when I was burned out. That's sort of how you know you're burned out when you can't quite like keep things in your short-term memory, um, and you can't really focus on what you're reading. Um, when you lose focus on what you're reading, especially in a reading comp, actually really in the entire test, um, you've already lost. There's too much detail. So the way to do it is, is really just to force yourself to get interested. Uh, now you might ask me, well, Charlie, how do I do that? I hate this. Very good question. Very fair. Um, what, what I always tell people is, you know, to imagine you're sort of, you know, locked in a duel, like you're playing a game with the writers of the LSAT, right? These guys in Newtown, Pennsylvania, who wrote this test. Um, you know, they're trying to trip you up, right? But there's no, you know, you're, you're only tripping yourself up if you get uninterested. The rewards for getting interested are substantial, right? I mean, you know, more points, better score, scholarships, admission, right? So, you know, it's a game well worth winning. Um, you know, the, the, the passages themselves are super dry, and I would never read something about Near Eastern sand art in my spare time. Um, but uh, to sort of read actively, I mean, you, could, you could do a Google search, I guess, on, you know, active, uh, active reading and all that kind of stuff um, after the, the presentation if you want. But, um, you know, basically what active reading is, is uh, sort of taking like an affirmative interest, really trying to, for just a few minutes, really, um, and yes, this webinar is going to be on 7 Sage later, um, you know, trying for a few minutes to uh, really sort of take a momentary interest in, in what you're reading about. And then after that, you, you, you never have to think about it again, right? So just by forcing yourself to do that, even if you know, even if, even if you know you're forcing yourself to do that, it's like a self-conscious thing, um, you'll still improve a lot. Okay, um, so very simple and very, very effective. Another thing I recommend doing is um, pausing after paragraphs to consider the, like, what's going on, the, the, the general support structure. Um, I'm not big into annotations personally. I think they're kind of a time sink and they, they threw me off a little bit mentally, like they just kind of took me out of the zone. Um, so I wouldn't usually annotate. I would just kind of make like light marks around things I felt were very important. But... Um, one thing that I did find was very valuable was to pause. So, for example, um, you know, I'm two paragraphs in, right? I just, I just finished the second paragraph. I take like a split second, split second, just to stop and think, okay, so the first paragraph talked about, you know, the general state of Near Eastern sand art. Now, okay, so the second paragraph was about the, you know, ancient Sumerians making sand art and how they made them in their bowls, right? Now, that whole, I wouldn't say that to myself that way. It would sort of be like a momentary, like, you know, I don't know if you heard my fingers snap, but, you know, it would be like a boom. Okay, okay, got it. Yeah, okay, got it. Then I move on, right? Um, you just sort of like take a second to decompress and understand that way. Very, very helpful um, in terms of understanding the structure of the passage, and that is a lot of times what um, what the questions will ask about, um, you know, things that relate to, um, you know, the, 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 the support, the logical support structure of the passage and things like that. And if you do that, you know, you'll also be able to answer questions where they'll ask you, um, you know, for example, like, uh, you know, questions where they make you refer back to a specific part of the text. Um, so, for example, you know, they'll ask you a question about, you um, you know, a question that you know must relate to the portion of the text where they talk about, you know, ancient Sumerians making sand art in their bowls, right? Um, so if you have paused after each paragraph, you're like, okay, yeah, I think the, the, the paragraph about the bowls was like the second paragraph, right? So you're, you're already targeted, you're already targeting your looking, you know, your analysis to the second paragraph, and you're not wasting time, like, reading through all this other crap that's just going to be a time sink for you. Um, that, that time saving, again, 
for the hardest questions and the hardest passages is uh, is crucial on um, on reading comp. Uh, again, if you have any questions about any of this, I'll have some time for questions at the end. I don't think Dylan's going to kick me off of here. I don't think that I have like a set time limit here. I'll try not to take too long, but uh, feel free to ask me more questions about that later if you'd like me to go into more detail. Um, and then finally, uh, I do I, I recommend reading. Uh, sort of sophisticated nonfiction, I'll call it. Sci the sci uh, Scientific American, especially, um, you'll see I listed three publications here, especially Scientific American, because I found that uh, it's most similar to the to the, pros the prosaic style, yeah, prose style uh, that's on the LSAT. Um, and that's where a lot of the science passages, those big scary science passages uh, come from, is uh, Scientific American. Um, the Economist is uh, – the LSAT's taken a bunch of things from The Economist over the years. Uh, the Economist has uh, – most of their articles are like relatively short, probably not more than like 300, 400 words, which is like the length of an LSAT passage, a uh, reading comp passage. Uh, very matter-of-fact, clearly identifiable support structure, all that. And uh, The New Yorker, a bit longer, mo uh, most of their pieces, but you know they use very sophisticated language, sophisticated syntax, which is like sentence structure. Um, in their in their articles, um, and uh, I, you 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 could also add the New York Times to this list as well. Um, sl slightly different style of, uh, of writing, but also very good, clear, concise writing. Um, all of that I think is very good, just to um, a make you a smarter, more you know erudite, worldly person, which I highly highly recommend, especially in this election year. Um, and uh, you know it, it'll also just sort of get your brain in the general sort of mindset. Of, of reading and understanding uh, passages on, on the LSAT. Uh, it won't seem so abnormal to you, and you'll, you won't have a hard time getting interested in the passages you're reading on the LSAT um, once you have already gotten yourself acquainted to reading all this stuff in your spare time. Um, okay, we're doing pretty well on time. A little over, but that's okay. Um, so you know, helpful resources and tips. Uh, I think this is uh, this is especially important because I haven't seen too many people write up a little list of resources they used. This is just sort of stuff I accumulated over time. So obviously, Seven Sage. You know, we're all here because we're Seven Sagers. Um, I you know I've been. I got Ultimate in January. Figured, all right, you know, fourteen day trial. Basically, I can always you know email Dylan and uh, he'll cancel it if uh, if I don't like it. Of course, I never did that because it was fantastic, um, and uh, I, I used the Logic Games curriculum extensively. I used the um, uh, the explanations extensively. I almost wish I, I got Ultimate Plus just for the uh, the explanations. Were really, really, really helpful. Um, and uh, the analytics, which I don't think you have to uh, actually pay for. I think it just, it's just a free public tool. The analytics are extremely helpful as well. Um, if you don't know what the analytics are, uh, you can go into... I believe uh, the, the resources tab, right? Yeah, yeah. On seven stage, you can go into the resources tab and look at the analytics. Basically, it's a way to put in all your practice test scores and your blind review scores, uh, and compare them and track your progress over time. Track like which, like where your problem areas are in terms of like all the different uh, question types you have uh, trouble with on all the different sections, and um, you know. It's it's extremely helpful to in terms of identifying your weaknesses and identifying uh, like patterns in your um, in your in your test taking. Oh, I'm dipping this week maybe because my girlfriend broke up with me. You know. Oh, I'm getting better this week maybe because I took that break. You know. Um, LSAT hacks is uh, um, it's a it's a website uh, created by a guy named Grant Blake. Um, he again, I'm not affiliated with any of this stuff by the way. Um, he writes books of LSAT explanations, uh, but he publishes all of his explanations online for free. Yes, I said free. Um, really fantastic resource. He doesn't have all the prep tests, but he has uh, some like older ones and most of the most of the newer ones. Uh, and um, you know, for for the times when you need like a, you know seven say you know if you need like a second explanation for something, or you know if this even if this is your only source for explanations. Uh, really fantastic uh, resource. He explains things pretty clearly and concisely, and I very rarely had trouble um, uh, understanding, you know, what he's what he said. So I, I use that website extensively for explanations. I also use the 
Uh, I also use Manhattan's LSAT forms. So this is especially helpful for older tests, not so much for newer tests. But if you're taking tests prior to like, I don't know, like I'd say for sure from like 52 and earlier, um, prep test 52 and earlier, maybe even 60 and earlier, um, the like the Manhattan LSAT forms have like, you know, the users will post like, oh, you know, question 11, you know, can you please explain this? And then like one of their, you know, like professional uh, instructors will pop in and actually give like incredibly detailed explanations. So also free. Um, I really only use that. I use that for logical reasoning mostly and sometimes for reading comp. Um, but uh, I would highly recommend that as a, as a free and very, very helpful resource. Uh, Power score. I use them for logical reasoning. I use the lo the logical reasoning Bible. I thought that was a good, uh, a good guide. Um, re I read it twice. I thought it was very, very helpful. Um, and in terms of soft, like softer stuff, like non-study resources, um, you, I think you have to make sure to to have a life outside of the LSAT. You know, this was probably one of my biggest mistakes. You know, every time I, you know, I would get an opportunity to hang out with my friends. Um, you know, you're you're probably listening to this talk and you're thinking, really, what friends? Um, but but you know, every time I would get an opportunity to hang out with my friends. Uh, you know, I would think, ah, oh, man, but this is an hour I could be spending doing logic games. You know, as I said before, there are diminishing marginal returns. How much is that extra hour really going to help you at the end of the day when you've worked for you know six hours doing other stuff and you're kind of burned out? It's really not. Like you know, you know there were more hours I could have devoted to this, but um, it wouldn't have been worth it. I, I should have taken more mental breaks. I should have you know enjoyed the company of people I like more. Um, and I, I should have given myself that mental rest. So make sure to have a life. Don't go out and drink all the time because that'll, you know, that'll be bad for your, your brain and your, your stamina, but uh, make sure to have a life. And with that, you know, make sure to take breaks, you know, at least one day a week, at least one day a week. Take it off the LSAT, you know, take that, take it completely off. Um, do whatever you want to do, but not, not the LSAT. Frankly, actually, you know, I took so I should mention, um, around the time that I had that come to Jesus moment, which, which was New Year's Day, I took um, six weeks to, because I had that extra time, I decided to postpone to June. Um, so I took six, about six weeks, four to six weeks, to just study for logic games the right way, doing blind review. Um, I bought the seven stage thing. Like I went through the whole curriculum, the logic games curriculum. Um, I was doing the blind reviews over and over and over again, and I wasn't doing anything else. No logical reasoning, no reading comp, none of it. Just spent like five, five, six weeks just intensively doing logic games. After I came back from that break, you know, my logic games performance was, you know, much, much improved because I was, I took time to do things the right way, right? Interestingly, though, when I came back and took my first prep test after all that, my logical reasoning score was better than it had ever been. And I hadn't done a logical reasoning question for like six weeks, right? Why? Well, the moral of the story is that once you have acquired the skills, once you've put in a few months to really master the fundamentals and put in the practice and the drilling, you know it. You, you get to a point where you know the stuff. It's ingrained in your mind. The only thing that can stop you is your own fatigue or your own physical limits. And taking those breaks, um, taking those breaks really allows your, your brain to take that necessary rest and look at things from a fresh perspective. And that fresh perspective is just totally, totally invaluable. So don't be afraid to take breaks. If I can come back from a six week break from doing logical reasoning and get a better score than I ever had, it, and believe me, that story is not unique at all. Um, you know, don't, don't feel afraid to take breaks. And the last, you know, I sort of freaked out to Nicole Hopkins about this about a week or so before my test. I was like, oh, but I'm planning on doing like a few more tests up until test day, go hard right until the end, you know, all that. She was like, no, 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 no. For the last week, you're not doing jack. You're not doing anything. Relax, light drilling, maybe just chill. It's not going to do you any good at this point. And I honestly believe that that advice, just relaxing, just chilling out and giving myself some time to recuperate, um, that was critical to my 173. 
because I was so rested and focused on test day in a way that I just simply would not have been if I was, you know, waiting myself out, um, doing press, uh, tests and drills and stuff in the week prior. Um, now that's pretty much that, um, any questions you have, I'd be happy to take them. I, th I think I saw a couple in the, in the chat right here. So I'll, I'll, um, I'll go back to those. Uh, let me, let me just look through it right now. Um, do, 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 was power score LR better than seven sage? Um, you know, I know you're expecting me to give a particular answer because, um, you know, this is a seven sage webinar. Um, I thought frankly that they, they taught the same things, it's just sort of a question of how you prefer to learn them. You know, if you have the financial resources, which frankly, if you like, you really should find the money because you know the the the, inve the, the return on investment here is astronomical. If you have the financial resources, I would say get both. Um, uh, again, this is all just personal opinion. I don't speak for Seven Sage here. Um, I would say get the Seven Sage curriculum and the Power Score because the Power Score you can it's not a video, right? Like it doesn't move along. You know, you read it at your own sort of pace, and you can you know go you know you, you just you read it. You're, there, there's no other way to describe it. You're just reading something. With power score, I enjoyed that, and I also enjoyed uh, JY explaining things to me um, through his curriculum. So you know, I I, rec I really do recommend both. I think that they teach this. I mean, the, the core concepts are the same. The logical foundations are the same. The question types are the same. Uh, the examples are the same. Um, you know, I just happened to start out with power score logical reasoning, and I liked it. Um, and then I reinforced it a little bit with Seven Sage. So I would say they're about equally good. It's just a question of, you know, do you want to, you know, re learn it through reading a book or do you want to learn it through, you know, uh, you know, the, the sultry voice of JY Ping on a, on a video. Um, so, so that is what I would say to that. Uh, how many practice tests did you take and how long were you strictly PTing? Um, so very good question. Um, I'll actually, here's, a, here's another tip. Uh, keep track of your progress here. The reason why I'm doing this is to show you something. If you give me one second, uh, I will show you my um, LSAT log. If you give me one second. So um, the, the question to how many practice tests did you take? Um, in the end, about like 35 to 40, something like that. Um, let's, let's see, let me just, uh, let me just bring it up for you in my log. Um, actually I don't have it right now anyway, but, um, so in the end I took about 30, so I took about like 37 roughly. Um, now the, the question is how many should you take really? Um, from, I don't think you have to take 37 tests. I think the optimal number, because there are sort of diminishing returns, the optimal number is probably around 25 to 30 out there kind of depends on you and how fast you learn and how, how good your stamina is. Um, so I took about 37. You don't need to take that many. How long was I strictly PTing for? Uh, geez, man. Um, so there's two answers to this question. The answer to the question you asked is probably like a total of um, uh, four, maybe six months right? But you shouldn't do that because you should. So, okay. So the, the answer is basically six months, but I, I did it in a disjointed way where I sort of, I practice tested the wrong way before the come to Jesus moment on new year's. And then I practice tested the right way, uh, after February when I had like, I had spent good quality time on logic games and practice tested at a slower and much more use, uh, useful pace. Uh, yada, yada, yada. Let's go back to the, uh, questions. Um, again, I, as I said before, I think as a rough, 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 impersonal, you know, breakdown, general recommendation, um, I think three months learning the sections, six months practice testing, uh, is about what I would recommend for people. Um, do, 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 I'm trying to, uh, go back and find stuff here. Sorry. There's a lot of questions. Longest break I took during studying. Um, geez. Uh, I, did, I never really took any complete break. Like, you know, I, I, I took the six week break from logical reasoning and reading comp to, to do logic games. That was sort of the longest break. Uh, longest break I, I spent like doing nothing at all. 
it's probably like three days. Um, you know, probably could have done more, arguably should have done more. How did I continue to maintain that skill level on logic games? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by that, Tyler. Um, you know, I, I learned them, you know, and I, I, my, my, my performance sometimes dipped after I, you know, did that six week, uh, intensive course in logic games. Um, but, uh, you know, you maintain the performance level by keeping, keep doing the, um, the, uh, foolproof method. Um, and by just com continuing to repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat, go over mistakes, you know, go over hard games over and over and over again. Um, you just, it just sears into your brain and even still it wasn't, wasn't natural for me, but you know, kept at it. Um, do, 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 uh, got to that one. How many PTs did you arrive at when you started scoring in the one seventies? So let's look at my, uh, LSAT log here. So I actually don't know, to be honest with you, cause, um, I recorded my scores on a lot of these LSATs when they weren't timed the right way. Like I'd go way over on logic games or logical reasoning or whatever. And I would say like, Oh, I got a 170 today, but it was probably more like a 160 or something. Cause I, you know, like I didn't, yeah, I wasn't strict with the timing, which, you know, you, sh you know, at the very beginning of your prep, you don't have to be super strict with timing because again, you know, accuracy over speed, but, um, yeah, you know, timing matters. Never slack on timing when you're really in the meat and potatoes of your prep. Uh, did I use an LSAT watch? No, I mean, I, I really don't get the whole LSAT watch thing. You know, like I used an analog watch with a second hand and it was just like so easy to reset it in between sections. I would set it to noon to 12 on the dot at the beginning of my test. And then, you know, once it would get, you know, I would wait, you know, while I was doing the section, it would get to 35. Yeah, but it's LSAT. Yeah, I know, but it was so easy. It's like 80 bucks, the LSAT watch. So I would, I would let it get to 35 and then in between sections, you have like three seconds to do it, but it was so easy just to pull the pin on the watch, set it back to 12 noon and then go on the next section. So really don't, uh, don't believe in the LSAT watch personally, but I, 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 you know, I guess I understand the value proposition. Um, how, uh, okay. On average, how many questions do you skip on reading comp? Man, I mean, it depends on the difficulty of the section, uh, on average, you know, for me personally, not many, um, you know, maybe a couple per section, but you know, that, that, that doesn't mean that if you're skipping, you know, seven reading comp questions, a section, you're doing it wrong. You're, you're doing it right. If you are skipping questions that you can't quickly identify the answers to, um, do, 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 do. What was your weekly schedule like uh, after PT and blind review? What was it like one day a week to each section or whole week dedicated to? Right. So, um, so very good question. So after I would take the PT and blind review it, uh, I would relax. Then the, you know, I'd may maybe give myself a day of doing nothing. Then after that, clean copy of the test, or if I didn't have a clean copy, I would just use the copy I had. Uh, and I would spend a day on each section, right? So like I wasn't actually, I wasn't doing it at a breakneck pace. Like, you know, I would spend a day analyzing the logical reason, like one logical reasoning section, excuse me, from the test. Um, and I would go over every question in that section meticulously. Then I would do the reading comp section, then the logic game section, then the other logical reasoning section. And that whole process would, you know, take me about a week. And while I was doing that, um, I would, because logic games were just my weakness, I would, uh, I would drill logic games in, uh, in between. Yes. From the same test I took. So all, everything that I said was like, you know, test, I take test a, take a day off, you know, eat one section of test a test a in the intervening week with lot, uh, logic games drilling. Then, oh, you know, when I'm done with all that, then I take test B, you know, Rinse, repeat. Um, okay, let's move down here. A uh, few, uh, sorry guys, uh, for the slight delay here. A uh, few 170 plus test takers I mentioned toward the end of the test, they started feeling fatigued and this cost them a few points. Um, so fatigue wasn't generally a huge issue for me. Um, the question is like, have I had any issues with fatigue? I only had any issues with fatigue when I was burned out 
uh, there was one point I was sort of uh, crying. To, I'm not crying, but I was talking to, to Nicole Hopkins uh, about this. Um, you know, there was a point where I was doing great on a test. I felt like I was rocking it. Um, and then come the fifth section, it was literally like my mind just shut down. Like I just couldn't think my mind turned to jelly. I couldn't even read, like I couldn't focus on anything. Um, and I, I said like, Nicole, what the hell is going on here? Like I, I, I'm supposed to be intelligent. Like what's happening? She's like, dude, you're just burned out. Stop, stop taking tests. So it really only affected me when I was burned out. Um, part of that is because I was taking five section tests. And uh, which I, I do recommend, just if only for the extra practice, but it also helps your you know your timing. Um, so I was taking five section tests. Um, so I, burnout wasn't a huge problem with me. I, if it's a problem for you, uh, take take five section tests. Um, scroll down a little bit here. Um, uh, yeah, someone saw that I had a Reddit tab open. Uh, <laughs> um, too addicted to Reddit. Um, how much did you drill each question type after each lesson? How did you break it up? Um, uh, so, you know, before, so the, the way I would recommend doing this is like before, you know, before you start taking the PTs, uh, you know, when you're watching the explanation, like the, the curriculum videos for the section types and the, I mean the, the question types in each section, you know, do the drills immediately thereafter. And then, you know, like in, in a couple days sort of go back to you know what you had seen a couple days beforehand do the you know do the drills again or look at a couple more questions in that in that subject area um and uh you know see if see if you can still do it once you're taking the practice test i would just sort of as i said like do it in that intervening uh whoever's whoever just joined please uh turn off your mic thank you turn off the microphone um Yes, I, I actually used RLSAT. Wasn't you know sometimes there's good stuff on there like some power score people post some like other tutors post. I found it relatively helpful. How much time roughly on a question before bailing? Um, you know it's tough to you you don't want to keep tracking time on a question per question basis. I would sort of look at my watch after every you know five to ten questions, but five questions every five questions or so I would look at my watch. Um, you, you know, it's, so it's not really a question of how much time on each question. It's whether, as I said before, you know, after the, the second quick read through, you still don't understand what's going on at that point you bail. Um, uh, do, 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 um, three watches to test day. Don't do it. Just bring a ton of pencils. Uh, webinar should be available in a, in a few days. Uh, what did I use to drill? Yeah, so I got the Cambridge packets for Logic Games before they stopped selling them. Um, unfortunately, they stopped selling them. I think you can buy them for like a thousand dollars. It's not worth it. Um, so to to drill, like I would, you know, uh, I think Power Squared, like the Logic Reasoning Bible, has questions in it. Like I would uh, scan like questions from old tests and stuff like that. Um, so I, I would use like the earlier tests, like pre prep test thirty six, for drilling. Uh, so it's worth buying those tests just for the uh, ju just to use the questions as drills, not necessarily as full uh, full PTs. Uh, do 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 do. Um, how many did I drill after each lesson? You know, ten, <coughs> ten maybe. Uh, once you once you get a little more advanced, I think it's helpful to to do to drill like entire logical reasoning sections. Um, or like entire reading comp sections or entire, entire logic game sections because it builds up your stamina and you just get more practice. Favorite pencil uh, has to be Statler Norica. Um, I tried the black Ticonderogas. They're terrible. They're absolutely awful. I have a box of them sitting in my desk right now because I just refuse to use them ever again. I think I'm going to donate them to a school or something. Um, you know, some like, you know, disadvantaged school that needs the, the supplies. They're awful. They use, they make light marks. They're flimsy. They feel light, light in the hand. Um, they're just terrible, terrible pencils. It was a waste of $10. Um, the Statler Norcas, um, they have a much fuller feel on the hand. They, they dull a little bit easy, easier, but they make much darker. Uh, thicker marks. So recommend the Norcas. Um, did I test five sections? Uh, yes. Occasionally I would cheat, do four sections, which is fine, uh, but not ideal. I do recommend five sections, although there's, you know, it's not orthodoxy. Did I ever experiment and go to eight sections? Um, some people have said that that's helpful. Frankly, I just 
did like the, the thought of doing it was so off putting that I never, I never actually did it. And, uh, you know, frankly, you know, you risk burning yourself out a little bit if you do that. Um, so, you know, up to you, there's, there may be some value in it. I, I don't have any personal experience. Um, let's see, do we have any, a uh, couple more questions here? Um, my scroll wheels sort of, uh, acting up apologies. Uh, act, so accuracy over timing, um, always feel time pressure. Uh, how would you recommend to do untimed sections? When do you know if you're ready for time sections? Um, you know, so I would say, you know, accurate. So you, you can do untimed sections in, you know, maybe the first, you know, week or two really of your, you know, trying to master a, a particular section type. But, um, it's useful just to time yourself just to, just to figure out like, you know, like where you stand. Um, and obviously like when you're practicing, there's no harm in going over time because you know, you're not taking a real test. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, you do want to time yourself. I think, you know, you're ready for, for, you know, stepping up to, you know, time tests and uh, time sections and for pushing yourself a little bit when, uh, you, you know, when you really feel, you, you, you sort of feel it. You feel like you're sort of getting what they're asking and what they're getting at. Um, and, you know, you'll see, your, you'll see your accuracy go up. That's when you can start pushing yourself a little bit on the speed. Um, how long did it take you to – so I actually didn't go through the entire core curriculum. I mostly use it for logic games, sort of reinforce my logical reasoning prowess a little bit. Um, uh, so I, I can't tell you how it takes to go through the entire core curriculum. But I bet, I think I've heard this from other people, you know, if you want to really go through it in a methodical, correct way, it would probably take you a couple months to do, probably two to three months, sort of in line with my recommendation about taking about three months to um, do the pre-prep test stuff. I'll take maybe one or two more questions here and then we'll end it because we're a little, uh, we're getting a little long here. This The webinar will be posted on 7 Sage, and again, you can contact me by using at C. Melman 95 on, uh, on 7 Sage. I will dip in occasionally. Uh, correct, Tyler. You don't want to go too fast through the curriculum. It's fundamental stuff. You have to learn it first. If you, you know, if you build a shoddy foundation for a skyscraper or any building, it's got, the, the building is going to come down. You know, uh, it's only as strong as the, uh, as the foundation. Uh, so practice, uh, does, so should you, pr uh, practice reading comp on time for accuracy first? Again, like maybe at the very beginning, um, you do want to get a sense of timing though. You want to get a sense of like how long it's taking you to do, um, individual, you know, passages and, you know, the entire section. Um, so I would time it if only just for your own information purposes. I, I will say, by the way, here's a tip. Um, when I was doing logical reasoning drills, not when I would do practice tests because you want to simulate the test as accurately as possible. Um, but when I was doing logical, I mean, not logical reasoning, uh, logic games drills, uh, I would, ha I would have use my phone as a stopwatch and make it count up. And then after each game of the four game set, I would hit lap and then it would sort of record like the, the amount of time it took for me to do each individual game. And so I would be able to like time myself on the entire section and I would get my individual game splits, which was really helpful when comparing my performance against the, um, seven sage, uh, targets. Also helpful, helpful resource, download this, the, uh, seven sage app, use the, the proctor immensely, immensely valuable into simulating real test day conditions, uh, conditions on your practice tests. If you're not simulating real test day conditions on your practice tests, they're not really practice tests. So, you know, um, do it, you know, uh, no, no, let, uh, letting yourself go over time. Use the seven sage proctor highly recommended. Um, do we, re I don't read the, no, I, I don't read the magazines front to back when I, when I read like scientific American or the economist, I just go online, you know, I, I pick out a couple articles and, uh, and read them. Uh, do I seek out the ones I'm not interested in? I mean, you know, I, I'm not interested in a lot of stuff on, on Scientific American. You know what I mean? It's like, it's all taking a pill. Um, so I'll, I'll maybe take you know one more question and then uh, I'll let you guys go. If anyone if anyone else has uh, any more questions.
Nope. All right. Well, thank you. I uh, appreciate it, guys. This uh, recording should be posted on 7 Sage relatively soon. And I uh, thank you all for taking the time to be with me today. Uh, I've honestly looked forward to sharing this story for quite a while now. It's very, very gratifying for me. And you can find me on 7 Sage at cmelman95. Um, you know, whenever, honestly, you know, I'm happy to answer any and, and all questions, happy to give back to the community in, in any way possible. Um, so thanks guys. Hope you have a good night. Happy hump day. Hope the rest of your week goes, uh, goes pretty great. Uh, maybe you can turn into the democratic national convention or whatever, uh, if you want to, but, uh, thanks guys for tuning in and, uh, I'll see you on the forums. Bye now.